All right, well, now for our third film in this live recording uh, is a movie called Pre Chol Su Li. Let's take a glimpse at the uh, introduction to this film. We are so pleased to have the director and producer of this film, Julie Ha, and the producer, Eugene Yi. Uh, this was definitely one of my favorite films uh, for so many reasons. It's a piece of history that somehow has not been maybe entirely lost, but has been very uh, hidden from a lot of people. And I so applaud you and bring the story to the surface. And I'm particularly impressed because both of you, I believe, are first time filmmakers. This That's is your right. first film. That's right. And Eugene is director producer also. For the, yes, yeah. director producer. Uh, forgive me, you're both directed and produced. And uh, you uh, met as journalists, I believe, at Coriam Journal many years ago. Is that correct? That's right. That's, That's right. right. And it's wonderful to follow these threads, just talking about Korean Journal for starters, that was started by James Wu, who's now known for, you know, having created the Unforgettable Gala. But it's interesting to follow the careers of so many people who've been in the midst and have done their part to enhance our community in, in many different ways. But, um, mm -hmm. but you, you met then, when did you have the idea to, to make a film about Chul Su Lee? Yeah, well, um, well, I guess, first of all, I'd say I would never would have thought of making a film if I weren't friends with Eugene <laughs> and if we we didn't um, collaborate as journalists first because um, I didn't have any filmmaking aspirations to begin with. Um, but both of us have known about the um, Chilsuli case for um, quite a long time. Um, I, um, I found out about it and Eugene found out about it through K.W. Lee the journalist in the film who, who, whose series of stories inspire the movement. Um, he's a very influential figure in both our lives. For me personally, I met him when I was 18 years old and he inspired me to wanna to become a journalist. Um, but we didn't think about um, making a film about it until 2014. And I had attended the funeral of Chol Su Lee at that time. And while I was there, I was um, just really struck by this feeling of heaviness um, in the space. The funeral was attended by many of the activists who had come to Cholsu's aid decades earlier. It was attended by K.W. Lee and many were expressing like the, such deep regret that they hadn't done enough to save him. Mm -hmm. um, even though they had dedicated, you know, six years of their lives, it was a six year movement um, to free him. And even many of them tried to help him even after his release when he was um, struggling. Um, and I was struck by that depth of humanity and compassion that they had. And then KW, meanwhile, was, uh, he was in so much anguish. He, he cried out, like, why is this story, like, still underground after all these years? This was a, a landmark Asian American movement, you know, that, um, that basically asserted that this young, poor Korean immigrant street kid was with, worth their time, attention, and compassion. And we, you know, and formed a landmark movement around it. Why is this history not known? Um, and Eugene and I, um, you know, we were talking maybe it was almost a year later and um, about making a film together. And I told him about this heaviness and I just, it just, you know, stayed with me. And um, we just knew that we had to dig in and excavate this story that we couldn't let it be buried in history. It was too important. Um, we, we have always been passionate about telling Asian American stories with complexity and nuance. And so we just decided we, we had to do it. Um, it, you know, I often tell people like, it felt like the story needed a release and that's, you know, and that's why we just, we went on this six year journey, um, to make this film. Six years. Wow. Yeah, six years. And six years because you were tracking down a lot of people and, uh, finding footage or, you know, what, what was the process like? Oh, I mean, we, you know, when we first started, it really was just the two of us. And, and, and though I had a foot in the filmmaking world, um, I work as a video editor. 
um, you know, this was a completely new role for, for, for me as well. And in, in some ways, so I really have to thank Julie for, for trusting me and in, in, in coming along on this um, when I asked her to, but, you know, when it was, when we first started, it was just the two of us and we were wearing all the hats. We were fundraising, we were producing, we were directing, we were, um, we were prepping for the interviews and doing the research. Um, I was editing and even you know, even filming at the time, and I definitely do not consider myself a cinematographer because I have too much respect for what uh, True DP does. So, uh, so, so yeah. So it's a true independent film, and it just took um, a process to get to a point where we were able to build up enough funds to be able to really mm -hmm. do justice to the story because it's just such an incredible story and such an important story that we just really felt like we needed to kind of keep growing in that direction and to grow the team to the point where we could really bring people on to, to, to really, uh, to really do it justice. I have such admiration for documentarians. I mean, making any film is difficult, but with documentaries, there's always this kind of open-ended process. You're not quite sure when you're going to get what you need or what the ending might be or whatever. Um, yeah. And what's so, there's so many things about this documentary that are so surprising. The first I think is that this story is not better known. People do tend to know the Vincent Chin story and a, a good documentary is made by that. And now we see almost a plethora of, of Vincent Chin uh, stories being made again. We see how many actually see the light of day, but there's a lot of interest in that. And for many, I think they think that Vincent Chin was the first time there was a, a lot of community involvement in, in, um, in, in revealing the injustices surrounding that case. But uh, the Tolsu Lee case has just as many, if not more, it's a little bit more of a complex story. Why do you think the Tolsu Lee case didn't get the attention, especially since there was so much community activism around it? Yeah, a lot of people don't realize that actually, the, you know, the free Tulsa Lee movement preceded um, the Vincent Chin campaign. And in fact, many of the activists who were college age um, during the free Tulsa Lee movement, they were so inspired by that case um, to go to law school and to become lawyers. Mm -hmm. And so many of them worked on the, the Vincent Chin case. And um, it, uh, you know, the Chelsea Lee movement actually became like an activist training ground, mm -hmm. you know, so it actually also helped create sort of a network of Asian American activists too, um, to work on the Vincent Chin case. Um, in terms of like why it's, it's not as well known, um, Chelsea Lee himself um, was asked this question when he was still alive. And his, his answer was, he thought it was because his case was messier. Um, with Vincent Chen, very clear, you know, hate crime murder victim, um, the perpetrators, you know, are very clear. Um, with his case, um, he was not an angel, as he says in our film. Um, he had brushes with the legal system. Um, he was no model minority. Uh, and then even, even when um, it ended with a victorious release, from prison, he stumbled and struggled in his post-release life. And so um, perhaps that messy ending, you know, is something we, you know, we as a community uh, also like um, sometimes are guilty of um, not wanting to, to share that history, to talk about that story. Um, Richard Kim, who's um, a scholar at UC Davis who edited the published memoir of Chol Su Lee, he told us actually when we were um, doing our interviews with him that he had never heard of the Chelsea Lee case in all his years of studying Asian American studies. He only learned about it through meeting KW Lee and some of the activists. Um, and so th I think there's just, I think um, we as a community sometimes need to um, take a hard look and ask ourselves too, like, why isn't this taught? And so we hope, you know, that was a main motivation also for Eugene and myself to make this film. We actually hope it will be used, you know, in an educational way um, and that this um, needs to be included and in part of part of our history. Forgive, forgive the intrusion. <laughs> <laughs> um, one, of, one of the things that really struck me about the case, and, and this is perhaps part of the messiness that that uh, Chol Su Lee himself refers to, is that he had a really tough life as a Korean living in Chinatown, and that would hopefully not be the case as much today, but the fact that he came over and he was so isolated was is really surprising that he, he was an outsider, even though he was among other Asians. 
And if it weren't for people like Renko, the Japanese American woman who took him in as a friend and KW Lee, the journalist, you know, uh, God knows where he'd be. And, and so I love on the one hand, the stories of the individual friendships and heroism. And I'm, I'm so saddened that he felt so isolated as a Korean among Chinese. Yeah. Um, and and that, that makes it messy because perhaps we, we don't want to acknowledge those kinds of divides, and which, which certainly existed back then, of course, maybe, maybe less so I'd like to think today. Right. It also shows just how, you know, easily Asians, different Asians were lumped in, you know, and so I believe, you know, it was basically Chol Su, um, he was sent to an Americanization school. And so it was like, go be with your kind, he was told. And so they sent him to a Chinese school, <laughs> thinking like it, it's going to be his guy. And it's like, no, there were no bilingual Korean teachers or counselors to help him. Um, but that was the way society Right behind yeah. him. Okay, we're going to yeah. send you with your gun. You should be fine now. Um, so that's part of, I think, the subtle um, examination in our film too that happens under the surface when you look at um, all, all, all whom society neglects. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And if I can just add one thing, I mean, I think it speaks to the diversity of the Asian American community too. I mean, it, it, it's a huge community. I, I mean, I recently saw a map that circled much of Asia and indicated that two thirds of the world lives here. I mean. There's such a diversity of languages and origin that um, oftentimes even gets masked by the term Asian American. Mm-hmm. And that conversation and that sensitivity, I think, is just really important to keep in mind because that was part of what led Chol Su to have such a hard time when he first got here because there wasn't that understanding of that difference. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He did, he got lumped together. He was othered no matter where he was. You know, why can't he, right. of course, he's othered in the Chinese community, he was othered. And, so yeah, and and of course, what happens to him after he's finally released from prison and living under those circumstances, it's it, it is messy because he was responsible for the death of someone. Um, he is finally released, and it's not just a smooth uh, path, you know, uh, paved with roses for him to be rehabilitated. And that's something else that we don't acknowledge enough. So. How, how was it for you when you made this film about wanting to show all the different uh, twists and turns of his life? I mean, did you ever uh, worry that that the dark turns were not going to be? You, you were you were clearly aware that there were peaks and valleys. I assume. Yeah. And yeah. It was all I, it. I think what we really knew, though, that we wanted to um, tell a very truthful and comprehensive story of Chosuli's life. Um, and I think um, it also, you know, working on it for so many years, I think what helps is like it starts, to, things start to crystallize about the story because there were so many ways we could have gone with it. You know, we could just have focused on the movement and the activists and mm-hmm. how this changed many of their lives. Um, but I realized, you know, I spoke about that heaviness earlier at the funeral I realized the heaviness was not just of the activists and, and KW and, and their ache um, for Chelsea who died, you know, um, somewhat tragically, but it was actually maybe, you know, the spirit of Chelsea Lee who needed to be at peace. And as, as burdensome as it was to become the symbol of a movement, he was also very grateful. He had a lot of love for, mm-hmm. for these activists and for KW. And so for the, you know, I thought about how like he might be in pain um, knowing that they're carrying this ache, you know? Um, and it's, it was so interesting hearing Ham, Ham talk about how, how personal his film was because it touched me because I thought about that. You know, I, I feel like I wanted to make the film to comfort KW, my mentor, you know? Um, and so I think, you know, once that became more crystallized, it was just about like, Chol Su being able to explain what happened to him and all that he had to overcome to explain all the people who, to all the people who embraced him. This, this is my story, you know, even from birth, you know, I had to overcome so much in my life. And so please try to understand, yeah. you know, and, um, and I think trying to bring Chol Su's spirit at peace by bringing some peace 
to the to the, all the people who embraced Chelsu. Mm, very yeah. well said. Very well said. Because when you commit to a movement and you put a lot of effort into activism and certain causes, you know, you want it to have a happy ending. Yeah. <laughs> you want to know that your efforts were were justified. You know, and but it really ties up neatly in a bow. It's, that's that's yeah. why the final lines, I don't know if I should reveal them, but by the final lines that Chelsea delivers are so important to us because that was the message we feel like he wanted to give to everyone. Yeah. 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 Well, it, it's, you know, the movie is so important for just those of us who feel like we've been part of an ongoing movement that started, you know, this is now 50 years ago. And I, I do feel like in the late 60s, especially um, around Berkeley and the Bay Area in general, that was that was in 1968. In fact, was when the term Asian America or Asian American was born, apparently, by a professor there. And it does seem like that was a period where a, a movement or at least an identity was born. And then this case, of course, uh, from the early 70s, seems like just a, a great example of how the community galvanized. But again, the uh, it, the fact that it was not extremely well known because of the complexities, perhaps of the story, uh, is, is interesting. But it, it's a, it's a great time for people to know about it now and for us to really reflect on the growth of this movement. Mm -hmm. um, what what are your hopes for uh, for the film in the future? Do you have distribution plans, or are you hoping to get distribution? What is uh, what is going on with that now? Yeah, at this point, uh, we are doing our festival run and we um, are an ITVS film, which means we're part of the public television uh, system. So we're going to be on public television um, at some point, probably next year, but we don't have a date on that yet. It's sort of we're, we're, we're figuring that out as we go. So at this point, we're still looking for theatrical distribution, too, because we'd love to be able to share the film as much as possible. Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll be on independent mm -hmm. lens, actually, next year um, uh -huh. at one of their stories for justice. Um, and then as well as plans to in distribute in Korea as well. And, um, uh -huh. we, and our Korean producer, Sona Joe, is sort of handling those uh, those details as well. So we're just, yeah, we're, we're at that early point right now. We're hoping uh -huh. to really get the film out as, as broadly as possible. I, I feel like the, there will be a very warm reception for this film if people get to see it. And, and I definitely hope they will because we hope so. Again, it's, yeah. it's so important. And again, is, is it is the 50th anniversary this year? I know it's the 40th for Vincent. There's so many things seem to happen in, in a decade, <laughs> decade markers. But um, right. it's, it's, oh, OK, well, it would be next year, right? Next year. I think, yeah, so, of his release. He was originally arrested in 73, but released in 83. Yeah. So um, there, there's such a um, such strong interest. I, you know, I know that that uh, a lot of curricula across the country, whether it be in, in middle school, high school, uh, colleges, they're really looking more closely at Asian American history. Hopefully this film is, is comes highly recommended or even required. <laughs> and this yes. is very, very important. You know, it, it's a, a good companion with Vincent Chin to show the differences of, of the two cases also. Yeah. So I wish you the best of luck with that. What do you have other things planned for the future? And now that you've gotten sucked into the world of filmmaking, <laughs> Actually, I, I hope you don't mind yet. And I would like to take a moment just to thank our team just because, Please. you know, as you said, we're first time filmmakers. Um, we worked our hearts out. We did. We didn't give up. So, um, But, you know, we could not have made this film and be presenting at Sundance without um, our incredible team. And, you know, many of them, uh, Jean Shen, uh, Sue awesome. Kim, yeah. um, you know, Sona Joe, Eugene mentioned is our producer in South Korea. Um, Aldo Velasco was our edit editor and edited with, you know, and Jean Shen also edited a co-editor, Anita Yu. Um, and I just want to mention them because, um, yeah, it, it, you know, that this is the reason why we're, we were able to make um, this film that we, we had that, you know, I've actually told people like I'm very at peace with the finished film, which I never thought I would be because it was a very complicated story um, to, to try to do justice to. Um, and so I just want to, I want to thank them all, you know, um, Eugene and I both want to thank them because um, we could not have done it without them. And we often tell people it took six years to make this film. It took six years to free Chal Suli. Um, <laughs> you know, one of the activists in the movement always said, it's not a solo, it's a chorus. And, you know, 
we believe this was a this was a chorus, and that's why we're able to um, to be premiering here at Sundance. No, it's so wonderful. Uh, I'm sorry you were deprived of the experience of sharing it with people in a movie theater, um, no. but hopefully yeah. that will come about. And and I think that you know what I mentioned earlier when the subject came up is it's the collaborative spirit that that we mostly love when we're making mm -hmm. things. Oh, absolutely. Yes. I mean, I also want to highlight, I mean, our archival producer, Brian Becker, but also um, the the young man who sort of voiced Shosu yes. um, for the film, who, whose name is Sebastian Yoon. And actually, I mean, there's a there's a couple of stories that we like to tell regarding how we met him, but um, he just became such an important collaborator for us. Actually, our producer, Sue Kim, um, encountered him at a panel for another documentary uh, called College Behind Bars. Uh, which is about the Bard Prison Initiative, through which incarcerated people can earn college credits while they're still imprisoned. And sh to her surprise, it was a young Korean American man who was part of that panel. And he's actually one of the, the participants in that series. And, you know, what impressed Sue when she saw him was just the conviction and the passion and the intensity that he spoke about his experience with. And so she had a sense that she that he might be a good match for our project in one way or another. And so when it came time for us to find someone to, to voice Chol Su Lee, mm -hmm. because we had his written memoirs, so we know what he was going through on the, like internally, but we needed to give voice to that so people could mm -hmm. feel that. And, um, you know, she connected us to him. And from there, just this incredible collaboration emerged. Mm -hmm. I mean, he helped us not just by voicing Chol Su, but by shaping the script as well. And really helping us emphasize what, um, what what we've been talking about a little bit this whole time, the loneliness that Chelsea felt his whole life, but which took on special power and special uh, and had this incredible impact on him when he was in prison. Um, just the way that someone who was in prison experiences that loneliness. And to be able to give our depiction of Chosu, that kind of heart was something that we were struggling with, frankly. Mm -hmm. But through this collaboration, it was just really, I mean, I, it's still one of my favorite things about the process of having made the film. And we just consider ourselves so lucky to have been able to meet him. Mm. Yeah, I'm so glad you mentioned Sebastian. Yeah, he, he just, um, yeah, he made everything, uh, you know, we've told him before, it's like, once you joined, everything fell into place. Oh. Yeah, everything fell into place. And um he said he could identify so much with Chul Suli. You know, he read his memoir, he read, looked at some of the interviews. And so he, you know, he he was released from prison in 2019. And he said, you know, obviously the, the tr he, he had his own trauma from, from his own incarceration experience. And yet he was willing to revisit, you know, uh, those experiences in order to give voice to Chul Suli, you know, in order to help people understand him. And that was very important to Sebastian. He was so passionate about it. He's like, I want people to like open their hearts and minds, you know, to, to Chosu Lee about how hard it was, you know, to reenter society and people wanting you to be a certain way. And it's very difficult. And so the fact that he personalized mm -hmm. this so much um, and then was willing to, um, to put himself through that um, was just really touching. And we're just, yes, we're so grateful to him. Yeah. There's just a generosity in terms of what he shared with us that still just boggles my mind. Um, well, I think we're in an age where we're trying to bring more compassion to many underrepresented voices and individuals, right? And and uh, there, they, I've seen some very, very touching films about prisoners and prison reform. One of them is called The Exonerated. And what strikes me, which is the same thing that Tulsa Lee had, which is it's almost like if you've survived that system, you've transcended it to the point where you're like a bodhisattva. You know, you, you have to become so spiritually evolved just to survive. And when I saw this film and, and heard a number of the people who were exonerated from DNA testing, they were somehow lacking in bitterness. You know, they've been wrongly accused and imprisoned for many, many, many years. And being released into society with 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 less than what you know what someone else who had been convicted uh, with you know uh, no no tools uh, no no transition and yet they have a sense of this kind of transcendence and I find that to be um, 
you know, really touching. And I think Tulsulu he had that, you know, he had to have had it. How how else? Oh. I know. I, I mean, I, that's a that's a beautiful, beautiful thing to have received to have sort of felt from 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 that film. Um, but that's also such a high bar to to give put on people to, to to force them to achieve sainthood to be able to survive. And I think Tulsus actually, you know, his struggles reflect the fact that it that it wasn't easy, and there was no conversation about reentry back then. And one of the statistics that that Sebastian sort of shared with us was that um, over fifty percent of people who uh, are are released from prison uh, go back. Recidivism remains a huge problem, right. and it's um, it's something that was not talked about much in Chelsu's time, and Chelsu clearly struggled with it. And I think this is where it kind of comes back to that compassion that you were talking about, I think, in terms of making sure that when someone is struggling like that, when someone is going through something like that, there's an understanding of their, their fuller humanity. And uh, we hope that our film can be sort of part of that, because I think that's really what, by telling the full story of Charles Zuli and letting him talk about what he went through, you get a sort of glimpse into another person's right. soul, we hope. Yeah. And and to sort of try and take that and 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 help us sort of grow into something that um, where we can might be able to have more of that in our own lives. Yeah. Well, and that's exactly what I meant is that they manage to survive and they have to do so without being constantly angry and 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 really self destructing because many people would not survive. But then the other part of that is how how do you survive in the in the quote unquote real world? Right. Having gone through all that, there's always going to be scars, and if you don't have a, a, you know, a system that can help you or the right, the right kind of support, I mean, there's just that's that's a whole other thing. So there needs to be compassion about that part of their lives. So it's just Absolutely. it's really uh, a very complex. You know, we're we're uh, not well equipped, really. We're not well equipped at all to do. handle this. Yeah. I, I was just going to add, I do think the bitterness ate away at him, actually. The mm -hmm. fact that um, the DA and the, pro the, the, um, police, de the police department, um, they did never admit um, in his lifetime that they did anything wrong. Um, and I think that did eat away at him. And maybe it did contribute to his self-destructive behavior. Um, and, I'll, you know, um, I'll share a story with you. We did not put him on camera, but I did reach out to um, the police detective who's in the film, um, Detective Falzone, um, and um, I just cold called him one day and I, and I uh, asked him about the case and um, he's given me permission to, to say this publicly. Uh, he remembered the case right away and he, he just said to me, um, you know, in my 22 years of working homicide, the Chelsuli case is the one case where um, when I meet my maker, I want to know the truth that he had reservations um, about whether or not Chosuli was the real killer. Interesting. And, and I told him, I said, you know, Chosuli was very upset about that, um, that that was never, um, n never admitted. And I said, this film wants to give him some peace. Mm -hmm. Can I share this if mm -hmm. ever asked about it? Mm -hmm. And he said, yes. Wow. Ah, yeah, this is, um, it, yeah, there's so much, you know, and the, 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 the layers, the layers upon layers, and, and with each new experience, it adds another layer, you know, the victory, you know, the, the simplistic version is like, you know, he, he's really wonderful, you know, but with each passing experience, you think it just adds more depth to, to who he is, and it is very complex. Um, and then, you know, to have someone who was very good looking, if it's okay I say, and then having become disfigured for the fire, I mean, all of it is, it's almost uh, an, on kind of a mythological level because you can't, but it's also so human, you know. Yeah. Um, there, there are a couple of questions that, that are actually related, which have to do with uh, the actual, you know, he was so articulate about his experience that was also so interesting. Did you always plan to use his own words as part of the film? Um, and uh, with Sebastian, uh, how did you choose which lines he was going to narrate? 
you want to start? Yeah. Here? Yeah. We, I mean, we'd always planned to use his own words for the film and that was actually part of the struggle um, that uh, in terms of how the film came together. Cause we have, we had, you know, we were able to uncover like a, like a surprising amount of archival of Chol Suli. And I think all credit goes to the reporters, the journalists, um, and the activists, everybody who was either working on the case or talking about the case at the time. Um, and thanks to that, we had that wealth of resources. We also had his me written memoirs, which, which I mentioned before, but finding that balance was really, um, really the tough part to make it feel coherent and to make it feel like you knew him. And so we, you know, we did what we could to craft a script based off of everything we had. Um, and once actually, you know, one, one thing that actually freed us a little bit, once the pandemic hit, we really sort of leaned into our identity as an archival film and, a, and that kind of historical film. And that allowed us to really sort of take the memoir and just write the script for him. Um, that was what we started with when we started working with Sebastian. And then with Sebastian, we continued to collaborate and develop the points that seemed like they would be the most uh, representative of what Chelsea's experience was. Mm -hmm. I imagine there was a lot that you couldn't use. It sounded like he's a very prolific writer. So you had a lot, a lot to use. Yeah. <laughs> there was actually yeah. at one of the, the, the events, I mean, he, uh, Richard Kim, the professor that Julie mentioned, sort of meant, <laughs> said what he had 600 pages of, of, written, of handwritten memoir that, yes, that, yes. that he was sort of going through. And, you know, he, like he still, you know, he didn't, ha he wasn't formally educated in, in, in a way because he spent so much of his, of his youth in the juvenile justice system. Um, so it, it was really a Herculean effort to sort of mold that into, mold that, you know, that, 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 that text, but he was prolific. And K.W. Lee, actually, this reflects their relationship. He continued to encourage him to write his story, to tell his story, because it was so important um, to be able to, again, tell the whole, the totality of the story and just represent his experience and his humanity to the fullest. Mm -hmm. and, and he was writing in a second language on top of that. You know, you talk about how he was learning English while yeah. this was happening, yeah. which is... Yeah. Yeah. KW likes to say that, you know, in the end, like, Chilsuli was a poet, you know, when you, when you yeah. look at what he left behind. Yeah. yeah. No, he was. He was. And, and, uh, and, oh, if I may add, I mean, he actually wrote poems from prison. And this was, I mean, this is, yeah, a little maybe, I mean, this is one of the things that's left on the edit room floor, but like we actually struggled with that because the poems are actually, you know, again, he wasn't formally trained, but there are lines that are quite beautiful and quite striking, especially sort of coming from someone who had the experiences he had. But, um, but yeah, ultimately sort of in the totality of what we had to work with, it felt like his own prose words were, were just so powerful on their own. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for giving us this incredible movie that uh, should be seen by everyone, particularly those who are interested in Asian American history, but just anyone who's, who is interested in just a, a very human story and looking at the criminal justice system. Um, yeah, there's so much packed in there and, and I'm so glad you unearthed a lot of this material for us. When is the book coming out? Oh, oh, the book was published already. It was already published. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah I thought you yeah. said he was editing it. Yeah. Freedom, was... freedom without justice. Without justice. Uh -huh. okay. Order it now. <laughs> our, our free our plug story. for Richard yeah. Kim. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, you know, it, it does take a village. I can see how many people came together. And again, those, those uh, scenes with Renko and KW are so touching. And I think inspiring for people about how one person can really make a difference, uh, a big difference right. in, in someone's life and, and in many people's lives. And I hope, I hope that's one of the main things that people take away from this film. I know I did. Uh, there's always more we can do. That's and, right. Uh, that's right. And I appreciate that uh, this, you know, this uh, case from, from so long ago is now a, a reminder of, of what our community has been through and how far it's come and you know how the roots of it are date further back than many of us knew about. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, KW Lee has often said, like, you know, people without a history are hollow. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we're hoping what once people learn this kind of history, and not just Asian Americans, but 
you know, all Americans really, this is, a, this was an important social justice movement for American history as well, that people could, could see like, you know what, the story doesn't have to end sadly, you know, maybe we get to figure out how the story ends. What will the legacy of Chosuli and this remarkable movement be, right. you know, and how will we allow the story to move us, to change us, mm -hmm. um, maybe to inspire us to, um, to work toward a more just society. So we, we do hope that um, people will take something positive from it. Yeah. And know how strong our community is. You know, how when, when we're yes. motivated, we can really rally. And that's right. uh, yeah, that's incredible. That, that, um, that clip that you had from the uh, movie where James Woods plays Tony Serra is <laughs> quite interesting. Oh my God. Things, actually. And, and yeah, that, you know, we have to write our own history, basically, you know, the way that it be written by other people would not talk about the incredible, you know, strength and, and commitment of the community. Mm -hmm. And that was said when I saw that footage of how many people gathered around. And I know for myself, when I moved from, from New York to the Bay Area, uh, I was immediately and, and, you know, remarkably impressed with how strong the community was. And yeah. it continues to be, you know. Right. So, um, so thank you again for for sharing that piece of, of our history. And thank, thank you for us today. And I'm so glad your film is accepted at Sundance. And uh, what a what a wonderful uh, addition to to this year, especially as as many Asian Americans are thinking about uh, identity and what what we can do together as a group. So everyone, please go see Free Chol Su Lee. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, Eugene, for your remarkable work. Thank you so much. Uh, that concludes this live portion of Asia Society and the Sundance Film Festival 2022. We've seen so many uh, incredible films and heard from so many incredible people from, from many locations around the globe. And uh, it's just been very a, a very rich offering for the audience. And I feel so privileged to have been in conversation with the amazing talent that we were able to present to you today. Thank you for joining and hope to see you next year at Asia Society and the 2023 Sundance Film Festival.